Dr. Tim Anderson, director of the Sydney Bay Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies and senior lecturer and researcher, joining us from Sydney, Australia. Welcome to Minadakh from the Inside, Tim. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us. Pure pleasure to have you always. Well, um, what was uh, termed as a U.S. quarantine of Cuba began actually in October 1960, barring all exports to the country, aside from food and medical supplies, and over the next few years, adding all trade imports and even goods from third-party countries containing Cuban materials. Today, Tim, the country has erupted in massive protests over widespread food and medicine shortages due to the pernicious U.S. maximum uh, coercive pressures. Um, how do you read, Tim, what is happening in Cuba today and why is it happening now in the context of the blockade? Thank you. Yes, I have to modify a little bit of what you said there because the demonstrations that happened on the on the morning of Sunday, the 11th of July, were not spontaneous. Mm -hmm. And while they were substantial, they weren't massive. Um, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of counter demonstrations since then. There were about 12 demonstrations across Cuba of between 100 and 500 people. They were very well organized with uh, the counterparts in Miami, funded by the US government. And this is a game that's been on, going on for many, many decades. Now, it's true, of course, that uh, people are hurting in Cuba because of the US blockade, because of the US blockade on their main partner, Venezuela, and because uh, the COVID pandemic has pretty much destroyed the tourism industry. And also there's a very strong epidemic at the moment in Cuba, in all of Latin America, basically. So people are under pressure. Many young people joined those protests, but they were organized to be riots and to be violent in the way that, that's very unusual in Cuba. It doesn't happen very often. Um, probably the last seriously violent riot was in the mid 90s, in the middle of a huge depression then. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, the way the Western media has, has portrayed this has colored the way everyone is talking about it today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, some people tried also to take to the streets and share in, the, in those uh, uh, protests out of their agonies due to the economic situation. But then when they realized that there was also certain kind of pernicious aims out of taking to the streets, they retreated back to their homes and they uh, supported actually the uh, revolution. The international media, as you said, uh, Tim, has exaggerated and manipulated these events to depict mass opposition to the Cuban government and uh, police repression of peaceful protests and a regime in crisis. Well, some attempt to mislead um, as you also said, by claiming that the Cuban government is culpable of what's going on today over its repression of dissidents or for the mistakes made in the course of the country's economic uh, management. Tim, is this what it is? Look, it's really a charade um, that's been going on in many forms for many, many years. And uh, interventions by the U.S. and particularly by their focus groups, let's say in Miami, that are very well funded and carry out operations. For example, the protest rallies of the 11th of July had merchandise, wristbands and bags made in Miami called Cuba Decide, Cuba Decides. And so this was very well planned. I, I said to you that the, the protests ranged from 100 to 500, but they attracted a lot of attention because there was destruction of property, uh, shops, looting and so on. Um, Six days later, there was a rally of 200,000 people in Havana in support of the revolution. And there have been many other rallies which were often portrayed in the US media as protest rallies when they were pro-government rallies. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the mobilization on the social media has been tremendously distorted too. Um, there are reports coming in that some, a lot of, uh, let's say, bots or fake sites were set up and some of them were churning out um, six or seven hashtags per second. Mm -hmm. um, to try and raise the profile of these sorts of protests. So while it's true that people are hurting, people are under serious pressure there, but the idea that there is some sort of massive um, insurrection against the, the Cuban revolution is, is quite false. Right. 
Well, Dr. Tim, those U.S. unilateral coercive measures or so-called sanctions have proven to be ineffective after 60 years to break the Cuban people and their free will. The Trump sanctions and the aggressive social media war are the contemporary versions of the two-track policy pursued by the U.S. since the Cuban Revolution. Economic sanctions and the promotion of an internal opposition. The objective is, of course, regime change. What are those ubiquitously repetitive scenarios reminiscent of? Well, of course, we have these unilateral coercive measures, the, the correct term, as you've mentioned, um, for uh, they now apply to at least two dozen countries and they apply to the whole world, really, because they've extended for example, with the sanctions against Iran and Syria, for example, uh, I, even I'm in the custom of saying sanction, I shouldn't say sanction. It implies something judicious, but they affect third parties too. So people wanting to do business with Syria or Iran or Cuba uh, and a number of other countries. Well, of course, about uh, Syria, but they also apply Sorry. to Lebanon now too. Two. They apply to Iran, they apply to Iraq. We have a blockade on Palestine, we have a blockade on Yemen. Uh, there are these same measures applied against Venezuela, they've been applied against Bolivia, they're applied against Nicaragua at the moment, so there's really quite a, they're applied against uh, North Korea. So there's quite a range of countries that are under this sort of regime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, many of the firmly held opinions about democracy in Cuba and in the US of A bear an inverse relationship to relevant knowledge. As uh, you said in one of your papers, uh, as the Canadian scientist William Osler said, uh, quote, the greater the ignorance, the greater the dogmatism. Dr. Tim, as a thorough researcher on Cuban medical internationalism, on self-determination and development, independent regional integration and resistance to the wars of the 21st century, spearheaded by and orchestrated, of course, by the consecutive U.S. administrations. Why is Cuba a democracy while the U.S. is not, as you believe? Well, simply, there are a lot of participatory avenues for the general population to take part in decision-making. When they, for example, change the rules about pensions, when they change the rules about labor laws, it goes out to all the social organizations there. In Western countries generally, and the US in particular, generally there's uh, people get to vote for someone they don't really like once every few years, and that's it. Basically, there is not really a great deal of participation. So, and of course, the, the additional thing that disqualifies the US from being a democracy is that it attempts to run the affairs of every other person on the planet who will never have a vote, will never, there'll never be any responsibility for it. So uh, that is why empires or would-be empires are really the worst example of so-called democracies. Right, more with Tim Anderson, but after the break. إذا فصل قصير ونعود لا تذهب بعيدا. أهلا بكم من جديد دكتور تيم أندرسون ديركتور of the Sydney based Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies welcome back sir well uh, we were talking before the break about this comparison between the democracy in Cuba and the democracy in the US of A when it comes to imprisonment charge and trial and civil rights also educational and health standards and free press how do you compare and contrast between the U.S. and Cuba in terms of law and approach? Well, Cuba has a constitution which guarantees a number of basic rights to citizens, um, not just their political rights, that's there, but also their right to education, their right to health, and they're free. And so in the U.S., of course, it's one of the few Western countries that doesn't have universal health guarantee. People are paying for that, so it's very expensive live in the US and of course the nature of those sort of services like health services and education are influenced by the fact that it is so focused on commercialization and people paying for these sorts of things. So really citizens aren't taken very seriously in the US. 
and they're taken much less seriously when it comes to the questions of corporate privilege and war, which are the two things that drive um, big would-be empires in the world. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, uh, as we said that in March 2020, the UN's Human Rights Council appointed Ms. Elena Dohan as the special rapporteur on the negative impact of the unilateral coercive measures on human rights. Washington's UCMs, wrongly termed as sanctions, we agree on that, now plague dozens of countries. Why are these measures illegal, Tim? Okay, so I think, of course, they contravene a number of international agreements. For example, um, Cuba is a member of the World Trade Organization, for example, which is about non-discrimination in commerce. Of course, it breaches that. But there are three fundamental reasons in international law why most of the, uh, the things that the US calls sanctions are actually illegal, unilateral, coercive measures. The first one is that their aim is to bring about political change. It's coercion to bring about political change, which is in breach of the UN Charter and international customary law. Second of all, they aim to actually hurt people. Let me quote something for you from the, when the sanctions were first set up on Cuba. They wrote that the majority of Cubans support Castro. This is back in the early 60s. The lowest estimate I've seen is 50%. The only foreseeable means of alienating internal support is through disenchantment and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. Every possible means should be undertaken properly to weaken the economic life of Cuba, to bring about hunger, desperation and the overthrow of government. And you may remember that just a couple of years ago, the former Secretary of State Mom Mike Pompeo said something very similar to Iran. He said that if, Iranian want, if the Iranian government wanted its people to eat, they'd have to follow what we say. Mm -hmm. So the same type of coercion aimed at hurting the population is the second head on which it's illegal. And the third one is basically that these sanctions um, actually act to hurt third parties. In other words, someone wants to do business with Syria or with Cuba or with Iran, they face the sort of punishment that the US can dish out as well. But uh, as an observer, Tim, and you've uh, seen, you've read, you've researched uh, thoroughly all those countries that have been subject to this uh, unilateral coercive measures uh, campaign by the US of A, have you seen that such kind of effects were effective on those countries? Well, yes, in some cases, it's true. Some cases, for example, uh, I was in Nicaragua in the 1980s and Nicaragua faced a terrorist war, mm -hmm. uh, the so-called Contras who were trained in neighboring Honduras. And while the Sandinista government defeated that terrorist war, the unilateral coercive measures against Nicaragua, which were deemed uh, illegal and a crime, uh, the crime of terrorism, including acts of terrorism by the International Court of Justice, the economic impact on Nicaragua was such that they divided that small country and the government was voted out. So in that sense, Nicaragua wasn't able to maintain its, uh, its political direction uh, at the end of the 80s. Uh, of course, that the Sandinistas came back into power some years later on, whereas it was different with Cuba because Cuba maintained a strong degree of unity and, and resisted those, those pressures. Now, um, Tim, Pushed by the Israeli lobby, and here I'm shifting a bit of gears, uh, the Australian government is steadily moving towards an unprovoked aggression against Lebanon without even an informed public debate. The move will make use of a parliamentary committee's recommendation for a complete ban on the Lebanese resistance party Hezbollah a key member of the Lebanese and Parliament and uh, uh, Lebanese Parliament and government. Why this now, Tim? Well, it's a good question. Why now? There was a move when the US declared war on up to 60 countries back in 2002 um, uh, in George Bush's uh, national, so-called national security speech. Um, the Australian Parliament did, in fact, ban what they call the external military wing of Hezbollah, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. and that was some sort of compromise at that time, which meant that Australia and a number of other countries, I think Britain was in the same category, uh, didn't do what Israel and the US wanted, which was to ban the party altogether. Now, of course, the party's part of the Lebanese government. And for some reason, the Israeli lobby has been lobbying the Australian government, which is very weak in terms of Middle East policy. They effectively are an adjunct to the US government. They don't really have 
any real independent political will there. But they have been, the Israeli lobby has been lobbying to the point where they now have a unanimous recommendation from a parliamentary committee to ban Hezbollah. Why? It's going to damage the relationships that Australia has with Lebanon, which have been traditionally very strong. And the strange thing is, there's a very big Lebanese community in Australia, and there's a tiny Israeli community here, but of course they have influence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Um how is uh, or how uh, in your opinion does the failing imperial globalism help globalize the resistance tim well that's another question isn't it that really we see now as the uh, the extension of these the economic war and the propaganda wars um, uh, are cutting across very many countries particularly in latin america and west asia the middle east mm -hmm. We are seeing now more or less news swapping between Latin America and West Asia about the same types of practices, the same type of propaganda, which, by the way, I believe the propaganda is mainly to fool Western populations, to shut them up, to keep them passive, to keep them afraid, because, of course, the populations of countries under attack in Latin America and West Asia, they're very well aware of, of who's behind the attack on them. There's much less confusion. But that the, the same sort of tactics being used against Cuba now that were used against Syria before, and I might say the tactics used against Syria 10 years ago were those used against Cuba 10 years before that. Mm -hmm. So we have a cycle of these types of hybrid wars going on. And Latin America has experienced it for over 100 years. So there's quite a, a long history in Latin America there, and perhaps the people in the U.S. are uh, more familiar with that sort of history um, mm -hmm. than that of the Middle East. But nevertheless, the parallels between the, uh, the hybrid wars carried out are leading to stronger links being developed between countries in the resistance and also the big counterweight countries like Russia and China. So that's why the sort of networks internationally of the resistance are increasing with this really desperation of the U.S fearing it's losing its role in the world and lashing out in a way that it really hasn't done before because it is very afraid about being displaced by new centers of power, by new links, particularly between Asia and Europe, between Russia and Europe, and mm. of course the fulcrum between Europe and Asia, that is West Asia. Right, right. Uh, that said, well, uh, Dr. Tim, President Biden and the U.S. government cry uh, crocodile tears for the Cuban people whom they are strangling to death with those coercive uh, measures. Yet activists note that we did not hear a peep from Biden during the months of protest by the Haitian people demanding that the U.S.-backed Jovenel Moise leave office when his term ended or when the Colombian people flooded the streets demanding their democratic rights from the right-wing U.S.-supported government of Ivan Duke. It's always double standards uh, that have shaped the U.S. foreign policy, right, Tim? Well, I think double standards are really an essential part of a would-be empire. A would-be empire, of course, never has regard for principle or international law, as we call it these days. So double standards are essential. There was one British advisor to Tony Blair back at the time of the invasion of Afghanistan 20 years ago who said, get used to double standards, because, of course, their attitude to Afghanistan back then was it wasn't a state that was they were going to consider as a sovereign state under the principles of international law. Right. Um, uh, that makes it for today. Uh, yes, I have to end and close this edition with saying that, yes, we are all Cuba. Long live the Cuban people and the revolution. Dr. Tim Anderson, director of the Sydney Bay Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for your eye opening insights, which I invite everyone following our uh, platforms to read about more on the Al Mayadeen English website. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Always a pleasure to have you. وشكرا لكم مشاهدينا الكرام على طيب المتابعة للتفاعل أكثر تابعونا على صفحات السوشيال ميديا وحتى نلتقي من كل فريق عمل من الداخل من كل الميادين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله